Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay, but please um, please do let me know if you can't or, you're, or if you're having any uh, technical difficulties, please just do feel free to, to pop that in the chat box. But uh, otherwise we'll make a start. Uh, first and foremost, thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Um, we're going to try and keep tonight uh, or uh, the session this evening as interactive as possible. So obviously the proposed changes to the tax residency rules are uh, or perhaps a little bit confusing for some. There have been a lot of interesting headlines published and a lot of interesting uh, articles published, I should say, uh, regarding what these rules mean for people. So we're going to try and, uh, I guess, delve into and, and unpack some of the noise out there in terms of what it actually means for you. Uh, we've got both the chat and the Q&A box running this evening. So if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in either. Uh, the Q&A box would be better and we'll try and make sure that we get to all questions this evening. Uh, we're going to keep this capped at 60 minutes um, and we'll try and make sure that we have plenty of time for Q&A. So obviously tax residency, it's a very personal uh, issue or consideration. So we'll try and get through as many scenarios and, uh, and address as many of your questions as possible. Um, but otherwise, let's dive right in. <clears throat> so before we get into the material this evening, I do obviously need to highlight that everything we go through tonight or through this session is for entertainment and information purposes only. Um, hopefully a bit of entertainment, certainly some information. Uh, this is not advice, it is not general advice, it is not personal advice. So if you do wish to receive personal advice, consult your advisor or your tax agent and uh, make sure that they're registered and that it is proper advice. Um, Global Financial Consultants, uh, who I am employed by here in Singapore, is registered under the MAS. We hold a financial advisor's license in Singapore. Investments go up and down. That's enough on the compliance side of things. Let's dive right in. So a little bit about what I'm going to cover this evening. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of who I am, uh, who is Global Financial Consultants, uh, why you should pay attention to what we have to say. Then we're going to dive right in. So a little bit around the current Aussie tax residency rules, what has been proposed, where we're at in the, uh, I guess, stage of this proposal, because it is early days yet. Um, so what could happen? What happens next? What does it all mean for us? Uh, which we'll go through in terms of parliamentary procedure. And then we'll look at a few case studies, um, which hopefully will we'll cover most scenarios, but I'm sure there will be many uh, intricacies and, uh, and different circumstances. So as I said, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A, in the chat box. I won't necessarily be able to give you, well, almost definitely won't be able to give you guaranteed guidance on anything but I should be able to give you a, a bit of an outline of what it might mean, what you might want to think about uh, and what you might want to speak to your advisor about. And then we're going to look at what you should consider if you have assets in Australia, if you're an Australian citizen, Australian PR, or planning to move to Australia, what you should be thinking about uh, with your advisor, your tax agent, uh, your financial planner uh, in Singapore or wherever you may be. So let's get stuck in. So. Very briefly about myself, about GSC, I'm uh, hopefully, as you can tell, I'm Australian, uh, Perth, Western Australia, born and bred, and uh, moved to Singapore about eight years ago. So we focus or I focus on the Australian expat side of our business uh, in advising Australian expats all over the globe and, uh, and do that on behalf of Global Financial Consultants, which is now one of the oldest standing, non-aligned, non-institutionally owned financial advisory practices in Asia. Uh, and I, given the way the industry is going, I have little doubt we will soon be the oldest non-aligned um, advisory firm in Asia. So certainly something we're very proud of. Oddly enough, the business started in Sydney uh, back in the 90s, which is not why I joined, but just a, a nice little roundabout connection and then moved to Singapore back in the early 2000s. Uh, we have Australian expat clients all over the world. Uh, I work with Australians personally in about 18 different countries. So we'd like to think we know what we're talking about and what we're doing when it comes to Australian expat advice. And, uh, and that is us in a nutshell. And obviously we have a great deal of expertise when it comes to Europe, UK, Singapore, India, uh, and obviously the region 
uh, when it comes to personal finance. So enough about us. I know you're not here to listen to, to our marketing spiel. So let's dive right in to the changes to the current tax residency rules. So a little bit about what the rules are currently, because I think it's important to have a good understanding of, well, where are we actually coming from? Why have these, why have these changes been proposed at all? And what is the ATO looking to gain other than to try and tax us as expats, really? So the current tax residency test, we have four tests. There isn't really a primary test. So every now and then you'll see online and, and we do all the time because we have these conversations with a number of clients around this 183 day rule. And that is one of the tests. That is one of the questions. If you get hit with a tax residency audit from the ATO, there are 39 questions. One of which is, did you spend 183 days in Australia? And if you tick no, that doesn't mean you automatically pass the test. There's a lot more to consider. So the four main tests as they currently apply are the resides test, the domicile test, the 183 day test and the super test. So the resides test looks at your connections to Australia or to your country of residence. So where are you physically present? Where are your assets? What clubs and memberships do you belong to? Do you belong to the local Rotary Club or Bowls Club or Cricket Club uh, in Australia or in Singapore? or somewhere else? Where is your family? Do you have financial dependents, i.e. children or husband or wife, in Australia or in a different country? What does that mean for your residency? So the resides test is all about connections. You then have the domicile test, which is really all about your permanent place of abode. So where is your permanent home? Do you have a property in Australia that you're leasing short term so that you can go back and stay in the property whenever you're back in the country? Or do you have a property in Australia that's on a long term lease that's rented out, it's purely for investment purposes, and you have a long term lease in Singapore or Hong Kong or wherever else it may be. Now, just to clarify by long term, I mean two years plus. So I'm going to mention long term a lot uh, throughout this presentation. So when I say long term, it's two years and above. Uh, is what we're talking about when it comes to lease arrangements. So not a month by month sort of arrangement, but a two years plus. Uh, you've then obviously got the 183 day test, which we've all no doubt heard of. Did you or did you not spend 183 days in Australia? If you did, you're a tax resident. If you didn't, consider the other test. That one is very, very simple. Uh, and that has sort of been part of what has led to the changes. <clears throat> and the final test is what they call the super test. So this is largely uh, prevalent if you work for the Australian government, uh, if you work for an Australian government department and you're shifted offshore to Singapore or to somewhere else for a 12 month contract, you work for DFAT or whichever uh, government organization it may be, they're still contributing to your super. You're basically on a short term assignment and then you'll return to Australia. In that case, you would automatically be treated as an Australian tax resident because obviously that would just be a short term assignment offshore. So that's the current framework. It is confusing which test applies, which test doesn't. Nobody really knows. The key message really is just try not to fail any of them. So what has been proposed to change? So before we dive into exactly what the proposed changes look like, I do just want to preface this uh, with, I guess, a bit of substance in terms of what has actually led to this, um, the situation that we're currently in now. So the current tax residency framework has not been updated in decades. It is very, very old. It is very, very outdated. And it is certainly not built for the expat landscape that we all live and work in. And as you've seen by those four tests previously, it is very confusing. How on earth as Australian expats, as Australian citizens living and working abroad, can we have peace of mind that we're not going to be taxed in Australia based on the current framework? So that's what's led to the proposed changes. Now, I'm not suggesting the proposed changes fix that perfectly, but that is what has led to the current thinking. So this is what the current proposed rules actually look like. And it is based on a report uh, that was 
uh, produced back in mid-2019. It was picked up by the government in December of 2019. And here we are now, this was announced in the last budget, the sort of introduction of a simplified residency test. So what they have proposed to do is the following. So first and foremost, there would be a primary bright line test. Now, ignore the name. It's just a fancy way of saying the first test that you would have to go through is the 183 day test. Did you or did you not spend 183 days in the country? If you did, you're a tax resident. If you didn't, go to question number two. Question number two is the secondary tests. Now, the secondary test starts with the 45 day test, which stipulates that if you didn't spend 44, sorry, more than 44 days in Australia, then this doesn't apply to you and you're a non-tax resident of Australia. But if you did spend 45 days or more, then you need to pass, or I guess not pass, depending on which way you look at it, the factor test. And the factor test is four key questions. So this relates to all people who spent between 45 and 182 days in Australia in any given financial year. It is not cumulative. It is, uh, sorry, it is cumulative. It is not one day after the other. It is not consecutive days. It includes quarantine, it includes everything. So either it's 45 days or it's not 45 days. There's no exemptions um, because of quarantine or anything else. So the factor test that could apply is as follows. So if you pass or if you tick the box for two or more of the factors, then you may be deemed to be an Australian tax resident. And we'll, we'll delve into these a little deeper uh, throughout the discussion. Um, through this session, but the four questions are, do you have the right to permanently reside in Australia? Which very simply means, are you an Australian citizen or PR? For a lot of us, the answer is yes. <clears throat> the second question is, do you have permanent Australian accommodation? Now, this is an interesting one. So this is where investment properties become a very important element. If you have an investment property that is permanently rented out, and you don't go back and stay in it when you're in the country, this doesn't apply. If you have a property on the beach in Margaret River or wherever it might be, Northern Beaches of Sydney, and you go back and stay in that place whenever you're in the country and you keep it on Airbnb or some other short-term sort of rental so that you can go back and stay in the country and in your property in the country, then this is going to be an issue for you. The ATO could argue you have a permanent place of abode in Australia, and that is why you are putting it on a short-term rental. Uh, the third is, do you have family in Australia? Now this is dependent family, husband, wife, dependent children. If you have children who are uh, independent, and uh, just to clarify by independent, I mean under the tax code, not necessarily financially independent. So that means above the age of 19, or 19 and above rather, uh, they may still be funded by you or supported by you, but they are considered to be tax dependents uh, and not, uh, not uh, sorry, tax independent of you rather, uh, and not tax dependents. And the fourth, which captures most of us, is the Australian economic interests. Do we have Australian economic interests? Quite simply, if we have an investment property, substantial savings, substantial investments in Australia, number four catches us all. Now, what is substantial? Well, that will come out in the next update once we actually see uh, an explanatory memorandum uh, and some draft legislation on these changes. But the big one is going to be investment properties. So that's the proposed changes. <clears throat> now, the two other proposed changes, um, and now don't be too concerned, we're going to, to touch on the double tax agreements uh, also because that does play an important role here, but just to finalise exactly what has been proposed to change. The other one is what they call the commencing residency test. So for those that are uh, returning to Australia, effectively you will become an Australian tax resident as soon as you return to Australia. So as soon as you meet two of the factors and you're in Australia for 45 days or more, you will be considered an Australian tax resident. 
Now, very importantly, just to clarify here, it does not mean that you're a tax resident after 45 days. It means that as soon as you hit 45 days, you're a tax resident from the day you returned. Now, this is very, very important. Um, and certainly for those of you uh, on, on the call this evening, if you have your advisor, if you are looking to return to Australia, you've got bonus payments, you've got shares, you've got other payments from your employer that are going to hit your account, you may want them to hit your account while you're a tax resident of Singapore or any country other than Australia largely, um, because Australia tax is on receipt and you're a tax resident as soon as you land. If your intent is to spend more than 45 days in the country uh, for that given financial year and your intent is to return to the country. Now, the other one is what they call a ceasing residency test. So for those that are leaving the country, uh, they've developed a series of criteria. I don't imagine this is going to impact too many on the call uh, tonight, but just to run you through very briefly exactly what they are, you'll be considered to be a non-resident of Australia, providing you meet all of the following criteria. Now, this is those that are living in Australia and leave the country. So providing you lived in Australia for the last three financial years, your employment, now this is an important one, must be for at least two years. So that's really signaling that the ATO will not consider an overseas employment contract of less than two years to be you, you becoming a non-resident for tax purposes. Now it might be two years renewable, that's fine. You might be intending to leave the country for two years and see how things go, that's also fine. But if you're offshore for a 12 month contract, you're still a tax resident of Australia in most cases. The other one is you must have long-term accommodation available overseas. So this is not a month by month rental. This is not a short-term serviced accommodation, service department sort of arrangement. This is you sign a lease, you genuinely cut ties with Australia. And of course, the 45 day uh, test, as we've already outlined. So that's what's been proposed to change. Uh, and I'll walk you through exactly a, a bit of a flow chart as well. I do just want to highlight that this is all subject to the double tax agreement between your country of residence and Australia. So if you live in Singapore, there's a double tax agreement. If you live in Hong Kong, there's not. And there are very different ramifications for each. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through both tonight. So for anyone who's panicking and worried about how this impacts them or sort of worried about trying to sell their Australian property, don't stress. There is a double tax agreement in place for those, I guess, residing in countries where there is a double tax agreement. Now, I put together this um, sort of somewhat convoluted, I guess, uh, flow chart just to give you an idea of how it all looks, where you start, um, but it really just outlines exactly those tests. So you start at the top, 183 day test, do you work for the government? Are you departing Australia or are you already a non-resident? Are you commencing residency, i.e. are you returning to Australia or are you staying a non-resident? And then obviously the factor tests apply. Um, now, I will send a copy of a uh, copy of this flowchart uh, and a copy of the slides to everyone. So uh, don't stress about trying to, to take notes or copy this down. You'll get a copy. Um, and yeah, hopefully you can just sort of see how that all flows through. But it's exactly as I've just outlined. Uh, there's no changes with that one. <clears throat> so the next question is, well, where are we actually at? And the answer is we're at stage one. This, uh, this proposed change was announced in the budget. We're not even at the stage of there being draft legislation yet. So we need to see draft legislation before we can work out exactly what needs to be done and exactly what the proposed changes are going to look like. Now, hopefully following that draft legislation, there will be an invitation for public consultation. Uh, we already have a petition ready to go. Uh, we will be sending that out to uh, GFC staff and clients. And if we feel that the proposed changes are harsh or unfairly outlined, we will be sending that out to everyone to sign 
Uh, we've already got a few case studies together. But at the moment, uh, it's a little too early. Uh, we've simply been writing to ministers uh, to outline the challenges, I guess, faced by expats. So it's a bit early to start uh, writing petitions and getting people lobbying on the ground in Canberra. Um, but just to give you an idea of what's sort of happening in the background. So the next step would be public consultation. Following that, it would obviously go through the, the various houses of, of parliament, the House of Reps, the Senate. Assuming it passes both, then it receives royal assent. And following the royal assent is when it becomes law. And that is when it would apply from the beginning of the following financial year. So is it going to apply from next financial year, i.e. in what are we at about two weeks time? No, uh, almost definitely not because we're not even past stage one yet. Is it going to be in place from 1 July 2022? Possibly, uh, but the reality is we just don't know yet until we see draft legislation, until we look at uh, how reasonable or unreasonable it is, uh, we just don't know exactly what that's gonna look like, but we'll be keeping everyone updated. Uh, as we pass through these various stages. So very early days yet, no reason to panic just yet, um, just really things to think about. <clears throat> so a couple of case studies. So I mentioned the double tax agreement, um, and I think this is probably a, a quite a good time to outline exactly what that means. So if you live in a country where there is a double tax agreement, between your country of residence and Australia, the double tax agreement will supersede the 45 day test. So it will kind of come in above and beyond the factor test. Now, obviously it depends on what the double tax agreement says. Uh, for example, if you're an Australian living in the US, the double tax agreement is a lot less friendly than for say an Australian citizen living and working in Singapore. If you're an Australian living in Hong Kong, there is no double tax agreement Therefore, the 45 day test would apply. Um, so these are the things that we need to think about. Um, and I'll walk you through, I guess, some of the things that you might want to start considering, even though we're uh, just at draft legislation stage at this point. So a couple of very simple case studies. So let's just say an Australian citizen, Australian resident uh, is offered a 12 month contract in Singapore. Private company, public company, doesn't matter. Same rules apply. They're uh, positioned overseas for 12 months. Uh, they're offered a one year lease. The company could pay, they could pay again. It doesn't really matter. It's a one year contract. The Australian government will view that as a short term contract. Typically you're going to remain on the electoral roll. We're going to uh, keep your Medicare, keep your private health cover, maybe, maybe even keep contributing to super given how short term it is nine times out of 10, you will be treated as an Aussie tax resident. That's a pretty simple one um, and may not apply to too many on the call uh, today, but uh, just to cover. <clears throat> the next one looks at an Australian citizen, Australian expat living and working in Singapore, lived here for three years in Singapore and planning to stay here for more than, sorry, for, for another two years. Now they travel back and forth to Australia for 120 days per year. So they don't quite meet that 183 day rule, but 120 days, it's about a third of the year. It's a reasonable portion of time. They have an investment property in Australia that's tenanted. In this case, given the amount of time spent in Australia, if, an eight, if the ATO were to audit this particular individual or this family, the factor test may apply. As a very general rule of thumb, if the 45 day test doesn't apply, there's a double tax agreement in place. Typically they allow around 60 days per financial year to spend in Australia and not be considered an Australian tax resident. It's not a hard and fast rule. There are allowances, but that's roughly what is considered reasonable for work and family. So again, if you're spending a lot of time in Australia, probably not so much at the moment, given what's going on with COVID, but in normal times, if you are spending a lot of time in Australia, please do seek some advice, speak to your advisor, um, because there may be some things that you wanna think about here, uh, just to not blur those lines too much. 
And the final scenario was uh, to look at kind of similar to scenario two, except in this case, the property that the investment property that they have in Australia is tenanted some of the time, but they actually go back and stay in it when they're in the country. So this is the good old Airbnb. I want to stay in my own property when I go back there because that's part of the reason why I bought it. So why not? I keep clothes there. I keep a surfboard there. I might even keep a car there because, hey, it makes life easy. The downside of doing all of those things is it demonstrates to the ATO that Australia may actually be your permanent place of abode. What you've really got to, uh, really got to think about when it comes to your ties to a country, let's just consider if you live in Singapore and a Singaporean owns an Australian investment property, what would a Singapore citizen, Singapore resident actually do? Would they have a beachfront property with a car and a surfboard and a whole bunch of their clothes in the house? Probably not. And the same applies for most countries. So you've really got to, got to think about what would a local citizen actually do in the country that you're investing in, in this case, uh, Australia. Obviously, seek professional advice, speak to your tax, uh, uh, your tax agent, speak to your financial planner, uh, and just consider how these options might apply to you. A couple of other scenarios, Aussie in Hong Kong, I mentioned there is no double tax agreement between Hong Kong and Australia. Uh, oddly enough, this particular individual has lived in Hong Kong for 10 years and plans to remain there for the foreseeable future. Long-term non-resident, no meaningful ties to Australia, but travels to Australia more than 45 days of the year. So if the current proposed changes go through, the factor test will apply. So you'll need to avoid passing two or more of those factor tests. The alternative, same Australian living and working in Hong Kong, lived there for 10 years. Again, if they travel there for less than 10 years, sorry, less than 45 days, then they're not going to be considered a tax resident of Australia. The factor tests won't apply, so they should be deemed in most cases to be a non-tax resident. So hopefully they all make sense. Hopefully they give a bit of guidance to, um, uh, you know, I guess some sort of common scenarios. But as I mentioned, if any of them didn't make sense or uh, you have a bit of a nuance or particular circumstances, uh, please do feel free to pop them in the chat box. <clears throat> so what does all of this mean? What do we need to think about uh, as Australians offshore? So if we are living in a country with a double tax agreement, so personally, I'm in Singapore. Um, I believe a number of uh, people on the call this evening are in Singapore. For anyone who's uh, in another country, what we need to think about are the following three, uh, three items or three issues. So in very simple terms, if you live in a country where there is a double tax agreement, the tiebreaker test prevails. Now, what does the tiebreaker test mean? It means that you can't be a tax resident of two countries, providing you meet one or more of the following criteria. One is you must have a permanent home in your country of residence and not in Australia. As I mentioned earlier, permanent home, two year lease in Singapore, you don't go back and stay in your investment property when you go back to Australia. It's rented out or it's purely an investment. That would tick that box. The next one is the habitual abode. Now, this is, again, down to your club's memberships, lifestyle. Would a Singapore citizen belong to the local bowls club in South Perth? Well, probably not. Why would they? So again, consider where your relationships are, consider where your memberships are, where are your ties strongest? And of course, the third test is where are your economic and personal interests strongest? This is critical and this is really the conversation to have with your advisor. Where are your economic interests? Personal interests, you might have a husband or wife and maybe even children back in, back in Australia. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're automatically a tax resident of Australia because the residency test is an individual one. If your economic interests are largely in, a, in Singapore or in another country, you may very well be deemed to be a tax resident of that other country. 
and economic interests are health insurance, investments, life insurance, et cetera. And, and I'll walk you through some of the considerations here as well. <clears throat> so what things do you want to think about? Again, I've mentioned a number of these already. Where are your health insurances and your personal insurances? Now there's a number of benefits to keep your health insurance in Australia on hold or paused, pay a premium every now and then, and kind of kick the can down the road. Your, and the reason for doing that is so that when you go back to Australia, you can take it up again. There's no issue of pre-existing conditions. You take it up as if you'd never left. Cost you a little bit to keep it going, um, but I think there's a lot of value in doing that um, for a number of people. Again, I'm generalizing, make sure you seek professional advice here. Where are your savings? Where are, where are your investment accounts now? Here, I'm not talking about the 20,000 or the 50,000 that you've got stashed away in Australia, in your offset account, wherever it may be. This is really where are the majority of your savings going? Are your savings, are your ongoing investment plans being invested via a Singapore or via a Hong Kong or wherever you may be, via a local plan as opposed to an Australian one? What does that indicate about your ties to Australia and about your ties to Singapore? Uh, the club and social memberships, again, I've already mentioned this one. Um, as a proud you know, West Australian, if you belong to the West Coast Eagles Footy Club, well, keep that one because you could argue you'll never get a membership again because what a wonderful team we are. But in all seriousness, if there is a genuinely long waiting list and it's difficult to get back into that membership, by all means, keep it. If it's the local bowls club or the local rotary club or whatever it may be that you could get back onto in the blink of an eye, get rid of it. Why do you need to keep it as a non-resident? Or at the very least, put it on an absentee membership uh, because that again indicates that you're a non-resident of Australia and supports your argument with the ATO if ever you're audited. Uh, travel to Australia, again, we've already mentioned this. If you do live in a, in a country without a double tax agreement, track all of your travel. 45 days encompasses everything. Uh, quarantine at the moment, personal travel, family travel, business travel, it's all included. So start documenting it. If you don't, and you do live in a country like Singapore, I, again, I'm a financial planner, so with a little bit OCD about a number of these things, but I would also document my travel and the purpose for it. It's just very handy to have a record of why, when, how many days of the financial year did you spend there? Just in case you're ever audited, you have a complete uh, and solid record of why you were in the country. The 45 day test may not apply, but I find it just quite helpful to, to have a bit of a record there. Um, now, family splits across the countries, we've kind of already touched on, really depends on the country of residence. Uh, and again, supporting your argument that you're a non-resident of Australia uh, by ticking a number of these other boxes. Um, and as I mentioned, long-term lease abroad, uh, we see a number of, and this is probably where a, a number of people get caught out, is they get to their the end of their one or two or three year lease. They're not quite sure if they wanna stay in that place. It may not even be a question of whether they want to actually return to Australia or elsewhere for that matter, but they're just not really sure if they wanna stay in that apartment. So they go from that lease, they don't wanna sign another one and they just go on to an unofficial, uh, sort of unofficially agreed upon with the landlord month to month sort of agreement. By definition, that is a short-term lease and could actually create a bit of a problem for you. So just make sure that your lease is structured properly. It does support that you're a non-resident of Australia if you don't want to pay tax in Australia um, and that you are genuinely supporting your argument for living and working offshore. Um, so that that really is it in a nutshell, the proposed changes. Um, I do hope that that has made sense. I hope that that sort of, I guess, outlined the changes clearly. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll look, I'll open up to questions now. So please feel free to fire through with any, any questions that you have um, and we'll tackle them all. <clears throat> okay, so let me just read these. Um, 
Okay, so the first question is, um, so based on the double chance agreement, so a Singapore resident, uh, is it a complete override, i.e. there would be a tax liability in Singapore and no tax liability in Australia? The answer is yes, providing you, you meet the definition of being a tax resident in Singapore only. Uh, where you would be exposed to Australian tax would be if you have investment property in Australia. Investment property in Australia is always considered taxable Australian property, uh, TAP or TARP assets, and they would always be taxed in the jurisdiction that they're based in. Um, that's nothing to do with the double tax agreement. That's due to the fact that, that it, it is considered to be an immovable asset and must always be taxed in Australia. Uh, but any shares, dividends that you receive, distributions from companies in Singapore, your salary, providing you're a non-tax resident of Australia, you would be taxed in Singapore only. Um, you're very welcome. Um, I, I do hope that clarified that question. So, <clears throat> okay, so next question is uh, the, first uh, sorry, the first possible year of this new tax law change would be starting July, 2022. Uh, look, that is the likely um, likely outcome or likely answer, I guess. We are still two weeks off the new financial year starting. Um, I think it is nigh on impossible that it would start 1 July 2021. But I guess technically speaking, it is still physically possible. So let me just go on record to say that I don't think it will happen this, this calendar year. Uh, but yes, I would say the first likely year for it to start would be 2022 onwards. And yes, based on the current guidance, it has, uh, they have indicated that it would only start at the beginning of the financial year following Royal Assent. Um, so I would imagine 2022 or 2023. <clears throat> okay, so the next question is uh, payouts from CPF, CPF Life. So this is a, an interesting one. So for everyone who's a, uh, PR or Singapore citizen looking to return to Australia. <clears throat> so there's a number of things to, to understand here and I'll, I'll try and cover them all um, uh, sort of a, a, as simply and succinctly as I can. So number one is general CPF. So your ordinary account, your special account or your retirement account. Um, and I'm mindful the question is CPF life. Um, I'll just come to that at the end if I may. So CPF, ordinary account, special account, retirement account. If you return to Australia or you move to Australia and you do still have these accounts, the Australian tax office will typically give you six months from your point of entry to what they kind of call tidy up your affairs. So that would include to bring your CPF into Australia to denounce your permanent residency in Singapore, and bring that money into Australia and you may contribute it to super, you may do effectively whatever you like with it, it would be cashed out and transferred to your bank account. Now, if you exceed that six month window, any gains from the point of entry to Australia, any capital growth, any dividends that you receive would all be taxable in Australia. It is not quite considered a, an equivalent to superannuation, so it doesn't receive the same uh, super tax concessions that we receive uh, in Australia. So you need to be very mindful of that when it comes to transferring your CPF. Now, obviously the trade-off there is if you do withdraw your CPF, you are denouncing your PR and uh, potentially creating challenges to return to the country. Uh, but this is certainly not a residency or immigration webinar tonight. We're just, just, just talking tax. Um, now, CPF life. So if you hit 55, you hit 65, uh, you take out CPF life, which is effectively a retirement annuity, and you are an Australian tax resident when you're receiving these CPF life payments, yes, it would form part of your taxable income in Australia. Uh, so Australian taxes on worldwide income subject to double tax agreements which would also mean that you would receive the tax-free threshold of whatever it's going to be at the time, 18,500, there or thereabouts based on the current rates. So if that fell under that and that was your only taxable income, 
there wouldn't be a tax liability, but it would be treated as taxable income. Um, so hopefully that answers that one on the, uh, the CPF line. <clears throat> um, okay. <clears throat> um, any other questions at all? Okay, we have someone coming through here. Um, okay, any other countries that are, okay. So th this is really just a question about, um, are there any other questions, oh, sorry. Are there any other countries that are common, um, I guess, for Australian expats that don't have a double tax agreement in place? Uh, the answer is no. Um, Hong Kong is really one of the more popular ones. There are a handful of others, um, but thankfully, um, Australian expats tend not to want to go to most of those. Hong Kong is really the critical one. So again, as I said, we're not at uh, legislation stage. We don't have draft legislation. Um, so again, it's, it's a bit early to tell, but if you are living in a country where there is no double tax agreement like Hong Kong, I think very important to start thinking about what your options look like. Um, and that could be as drastic as leaving a country like Hong Kong and moving to Singapore or moving somewhere else, or it could be as simple as simply transferring where your investments are based. Um, but I think the earlier you start thinking about these options, uh, even if you don't look to implement them, uh, the better off you're going to be in the long run. Nobody likes paying any more tax than they have to. And uh, and Lord knows, I think we've all paid more than our fair share for those of us that have worked in Australia before. Okay, well, look, I think that is all of our questions so far. Um, I'll, I'll just give a... a bit of a wrap up. So if anyone has any final questions, please do feel free to fire them through. Uh, more than happy to answer anything. Um, yeah, no such thing as, as silly questions. So please do fire them through. As I mentioned, we are going to be launching a petition depending on what these rule changes look like. Uh, we are also, we have rather started a, uh, a bit of a, I guess, a questionnaire to gauge feedback from Australian expats. Uh, so if you'd like to receive a copy of that, it's very broad, it's very brief. Uh, really, all we're looking to do is gather more um, uh, confidential stories or impact stories of how these rule changes could impact Australian expats. Um, because the more case studies we can provide uh, to the various ministers, obviously, the more impact we're going to have. So we'll send out a copy of that questionnaire. You'll get a copy. Um, as I said, we're not releasing names or, or numbers to anyone. It's really just to get your story and get your feedback on um, on what you think. Uh, I will also, as I mentioned, be sending out a copy of the recording of the slides tonight, um, as well as my commentary. So again, you'll get a copy of that. But uh, if there are no other questions, uh, we can wrap up a little bit early. Thank you all very much for joining us. I, I really do hope that you've found it helpful. I hope it's been informative and, uh, and shed a bit of light on what Canberra has proposed. But thank you and uh, have a great evening.